Hey everyone, it's Conrad Bobby Luck here, CEO of Investors Prime Real Estate and author of Australian Real Estate Investing Made Simple, which has become the number one selling book on Amazon and I want to thank everyone for buying it. Thank you very much. Today I've made a video for you about buying apartments and I want to go through the general big picture, I guess, of what's happening in the industry at the moment in Melbourne. And I want to go through ma macro level and micro level analysis of apartments in terms of volume of stock on the market, future potential volume of stock coming onto the market, supply and demand, right down to layouts and configuration and suburbs that you can invest ap into apartments if you want average growth and areas that you need to stay away from completely. So it's going to be a very interesting video, especially for people who are thinking about buying investment properties that are our apartments in Melbourne or Sydney. So thank you for watching this video. Before we get started, a bit of a company disclaimer. <clears throat> I haven't spoken to you individually. I don't know your particular situation. So don't consider this as financial advice. This is just general advice for educational purposes only. And same with my personal disclaimer. I'm not going to you know, tell you that you're going to become a multi-millionaire property investor by following anything that I'm teaching. I'm just sharing information with you. And you can decide for yourself whether you resonate with some of the information. And if it doesn't resonate with you, don't do it. A bit about myself, for those who don't know my background, I am a real estate agent in St Kilda who sources properties for investors in the top 50 highest capital growth suburbs in Melbourne. My background, though, traditionally has been in mortgage broking and banking. I used to have a mortgage broking company of 13 mortgage brokers, about 28 staff, plus I used to work for Medfin in commercial lending and asset finance and residential lending which is a subsidiary of NAB. <clears throat> and I started off in financial planning industry with Australian Uni Funds Management. Um, and uh, before then I was at uni, drinking beer and playing pool at the tavern. The most important thing about myself is that I'm a real investor right here in Melbourne, having a multi-million dollar property portfolio. And that's the only reason why I'm talking to you today. My motivation is to get you inspired to get into the property market. And also my motivation is to to persuade you not to do certain things because I don't want you to guys to make mistakes. The last thing I want to see is investors losing money. And so apartments is one of those areas where you really have to be careful with your selection criteria. And that's what I'm going to share with you today and talk to you about apartments and which ones to buy, which ones to avoid. By the way, if you want to get a copy of my book, you can get it on bookonfinance.com.au or any good bookshop, Amazon, Booktopia. Or the second one also, Real Estate Made Simple, which is $39.95. For hard copy, you can get it off my website or Amazon, Booktopia, or any good bookshop around Australia. Now, let's talk about the market a little bit before we get into it. The market now in February has picked up massively in Melbourne. People were sceptical last year. People were depressed. People were in lockdown. There was a lot of uncertainty. Consumer sentiment was record low. And then nothing happened. The crash didn't eventuate. And then people got fed up at the end of the year saying, you know what, this thing's not crashing, we better get in now or we're going to miss out. So, so what happened last year is FOMO manifested itself, which is fear of missing out. When the year opened, everyone rushed back into the market and the market exploded in Melbourne and in Sydney and in Brisbane. And, and we can see now there's massive queues um, for opens every weekend. And by the way, I'm a real estate agent in Melbourne, so I'm out there on weekends either looking at property, being at auctions, or doing opens myself. Um, and so I'm in the market every day. I have never seen so many people being interested in, in buying properties. And at the same time, the actual volume of stock is 40% lower than the same time last year. So you have very little stock on the market in blue chip areas, and you have this extreme high volume of people wanting to upgrade or buy their property. And you can see there, even now, CBA forecast has been updated. And this is February 2021, 16th of February. House prices rise by 16% over 2021 and 22 CBA, which is a very conservative bank. Um, Australian property prices could rise further when lending laws are relaxed, experts say. The other game changer that's coming into the equation, and I'm going to get Stephen McClutchy, hopefully from Loans Australia, to do a video for you guys informing you of all the changes is on the 1st of March 2021, the responsible lending guidelines, which were introduced from the Kevin Rudd government post-GFC, are being scrapped. So people's serviceability would jump up by about 
10, 15%, especially for higher income earners. But also there'll be a whole range of new products and new, new loans that will be available for self-employed people and people with not, non-traditional income, I guess, sources who will be able to get into the market for the first time. So that's going to further fuel the property market in post-March. Now, we'll take a few months to create those products, so don't expect any miracles on the 1st or, or the 2nd of March because banks will need to create products post-legislation. But you're going to see a massive impact, immediate impact in the market because of that. And also, think about this for a second. I mean, the market's booming at the moment. What's going to happen once we vaccinate everyone? And Australia is one of the last countries to be vaccinated, and it will take around six to eight months to get the vaccination for COVID-19 through to everyone. But let's say what happens next year when the international borders reopen and all the people from overseas start coming into the country. And by the way, there's going to be a record high amount of people coming in to live in Melbourne because of what's happening in overseas. A lot of people are not talking about this, but I have friends that are high-level real estate agents in some of the best real estate agencies in Melbourne, and they're telling me they're getting a lot of phone calls from people in the US especially who are calling them up saying, listen, we've got 15 million, 10 million, 5 million we want to get out of the US because of the craziness and we want to relocate our whole family to Melbourne. What do we need to do? What are the properties we can buy? How do we get PR? Do we need to buy a business as well? Can you put us in contact with a good lawyer, a good accountant? Now, those phone calls are happening on mass and they haven't happened since the 2008 GFC. During the GFC, the same thing happened. Wealthy people were leaving different parts of the world trying to relocate their families to Melbourne and Sydney. So we're seeing the same phenomena happening now and obviously with Hong Kong people coming down as well. So there's a lot of instability in Hong Kong. Um, people are going to be selling their apartments and uh, buying properties in Melbourne. So that's going to further fuel the market on top of the already high built up demand from the local market as well. Westpac also has forecasted 20% house prices gains which is really interesting because Westpac is very conservative in their forecasts and they always kind of, um, they're super conservative. So they always under promise and try to over deliver on their services. They've come out just recently, um, and this is from the Westpac Bulletin, saying that, look, in 2020, Melbourne did negative 1.3%, which was, which was too conservative. But they think in 2021, Melbourne capital growth will be 8%. 10% for 22, Sydney 10% and 10%, and Brisbane 10% and 10%. Um, also Perth 12% and 8% for 2022. Adelaide, who cares? No one cares. Uh, Hobart 8% for 21 and 6% for 22. And Australia total will be, for the, all the major capital cities, 10% growth for 21, 10% growth for 22. And like 10% is, we're talking about on a million dollars, $100,000. So, you know, whatever you're going to be buying in the next, you know, two or three years, and I personally believe the peak will be in 2023. Um, so whatever you're going to be buying, you'll make good money, providing your selection methodology is, is accurate. And the more research you do, and the more knowledge you have, the easier the selection process will become. So part of this motivation for this video is to actually show you exactly how I look at apartments and how I feel about different products and different layouts of apartments. And I'm going to give you a bit of a guide about what to look out for and what to avoid as well. Now, by the way, I don't source any apartments in Melbourne and I never will. Okay, so if you want to buy an apartment to live in, I can't help you. I don't want to touch apartments. I don't want anything to do with them because I have a lot of concern for them from an investment perspective. Now, from a livability perspective, I actually love apartments. I think the, and I was recently, um, went to South Bank 108, amazing building, same with the Eureka. I mean, I would love to, if I was single without a family, I'll probably live in one of those apartments uh, in the city and then take advantage of all the facilities, the swimming pools, the gyms they have there. I mean, it's five-star facilities and it's all free with the apartment where you pay for it in your owners corporation um, but it's amazing to be in one of those buildings you've got gyms overlooking the city I mean it's incredible it's all being looked after cinema rooms you can have parties um, you can have entire dining rooms booked out so just so some of these buildings and they're probably the worst ones for capital growth but in terms of livability if you're working in the city it could be one of your best options 
in, in terms of your life, in terms of getting to and you know, out of the city with five minutes, you can walk basically or ride a bicycle. Plus, you've got all these amenities that you get access to. You've got a 24 hour gym at your disposal, a swimming pool, cinema room. You can have parties constantly. It could be an amazing thing. So, please don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of apartments, and I think we should keep building more and more of them in the city of Melbourne. I'm against apartments in suburbia completely. I think should, it's, it's terrible what they're doing. Like Doncaster has been destroyed now with these apartments, you know. They should just, the council has completely sold out. Same with Mitcham. You should not be building apartments in Mitcham. They're never going to work. So, you know, it's townhouses and houses only for suburbia. But in the city, yeah, build them up. Do 200, 300 uh, apartments, skyscrapers. The more we have, it just puts Melbourne on the map and makes us a large international city. So please do not confuse my like for apartments with my dislike for them as an investment vehicle. Two different things. The reality is that if you look at the investment vehicle, houses have now gone up to, in Melbourne, as December the 20th, $936,000, which is the median price of the average detached house in Melbourne. And look at the capital growth we've had since December 2009, where the average median price was 500000 You know, they've literally nearly doubled um, in value, so roughly 10 years to double. But apartments... The median price is $569,677. The gap between apartments and, t- and houses, and townhouses, by the way, are the same as houses. Townhouses are not apartments because apartments are built on top of each other. You don't have a land component. Where a townhouse, some of the townhouses that are sourced and sold have 400 square meters of land, 500 even, on the big subdivision. So they're literally houses that are built as a result of a subdivision. Um, but the gap is widening between apartments and, and detached houses because houses have land, same with townhouses, and apartments don't have land scarcity. You can always go up, but you can't build and create more land. So as an investment vehicle, what you want to do is target properties with the land component, i.e. houses, detached houses and townhouses, versus um, apartments because the gap is widening which means the capital growth is virtually non-existent for apartments and that's the reality the gulf between detached houses and units in melbourne units being apartments has widened sharply after the median price of a standalone resident residence in the city surged 3600 a week during the last three months of 2020 melbourne's median house price reached a record high of 936,000 in December quarter and is now 64% higher than the median unit price that the main house price report shows. That that, uh, compares with the average price gap of 52% over the past decade. So the gap between houses and um, apartments is now 62%, which is huge. And that, now eventually, yes, they will go up eventually when we have 10 million people living in Melbourne. Absolutely. The problem is that there's 60,000 apartments they can build in the city. At the moment, the vacancy rate in the city of Melbourne is 23,000 vacant apartments. 23,000 vacant apartments, guys. If you look up townhouses in Balaclava, there's only two projects at the moment for sale. If you look up for rent... There might be six or seven. Six for rent. We have 23,000 apartments that are empty that can't be rented because of COVID-19, because of no Airbnb, no interstate travel, no international students coming to do the degrees and no international visitors coming over to Melbourne. So it's a huge issue um, in terms of capital growth potential. Uh, apartments rents tumble off the cliff in Sydney and Melbourne. As a result, obviously, what happens is the rental yields are super low. That's if you're lucky to get a tenant in the first place. Apartment rents have fallen off the cliff in Melbourne and Sydney on the back of collapsing demand amongst international students and migrants. Um, and this is one of the biggest challenges that people face. If you've got six apartments, my God, you could be wiped out now if you, if you can't get rental. According to Domain's latest report, Sydney unit rents have tumbled to 2013 prices, which is which is eight years well, yeah, eight years ago, dropping 5.1% on the quarter and 7.8% for the year to $470 in December. This makes the steepest quarterly and annual fall since Domain rental records begin began in 2004. Similarly. Similarly, Melbourne suffered a 3% 
quarterly decline and 7.6% yearly decline to a five-year low of $388 average rent for an apartment. Of all the cities, uh, capital cities, Melbourne units have recorded the deepest fall in asking rent since the pre-pandemic March, down 9.8%. So nearly 10% drop in rental, um, which is huge. The main highlights that although the rate decline eased over December quarter, three consecutive quarterly falls have resulted in the steepest annual fall in record. For the first time in five years, Melbourne is the third most affordable capital city to rent a unit after Adelaide and Perth, the main said, which is very interesting. Um, <clears throat> As for Sydney, the main explained the unit rents have been hardest hit in the city and the east and inner west, with rents at the eight year low, while the lower North Shore is the cheapest in nine years. Two areas have, have bucked the uh, downward trend units on the central coast and northern beaches have reached record highs. So obviously people are leaving the city in Sydney and living in, in the beachside areas and they're renting there because they can't buy into those areas. So apartments in those areas have gone up in rent. Um, annually unit rents have fallen since mid-2018 but this trend has been accelerated by changes as a result of COVID-19. The pandemic-induced collapse to overseas migration and foreign student numbers has reduced rental demand. Units have felt the impact, particularly in inner-city apartments, which is where all the students rent, obviously, if they're going to Melbourne, Monash, it's all inner-city campuses, which are home to more rentals and have a greater exposure to demand sourced from overseas migrants. So the problem with these things is they're building too many of them, there's an oversupply of them right now. We never liked them in the first place because if you have a choice, you would choose a townhouse with the privacy, which is with the privacy of a small home, but without the backyard, basically. People don't want to live on top of each other and they don't want to have that interaction with, in the common areas with other people. And these things have failed in different levels as well. The biggest challenge with these properties is the penthouses. The rich never moved into these properties because what happens is you've got all these properties on Airbnb and they get rented for weekend parties by dickheads. And so you have every weekend, you have all these idiots in your apartment. It hasn't got that communal um, village-like feel. Like in New York, for example, you don't have that situation because you can't rent those apartments. You can't Airbnb them. So you have really wealthy, cool people living in these apartments. And they hardly ever move out. So you have this real community feel. There, no one knows anyone, okay? You've got idiots coming on the weekends having parties. So you have constant noise and, and disruption to the local people. 80% are empty because they were sold, sold overseas. So we know for a fact that 80% of these towers are completely empty because, and, and the reason we know is because the water hasn't been turned on at all for the whole year. So unless you've got a tent there that doesn't use a dishwasher, doesn't shower or flush the toilet, um, which, which obviously they can't, <laughs> they're all empty. So there's a lot of, see a lot of people in Singapore and other countries, Hong Kong, when there's economic turbulence in their own country, what they want to do is take a million or two out and just park it in Melbourne. They don't care about the rental. They just want to park it and have it as a security, as a plan B. And they don't care about the rental. So there's a lot of, these are called ghost towers because they're, they're, they're empty apartments and 80% and of them are empty, 20% are actually occupied. So the problem is the rich never ended up buying these penthouses for 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollars. Because they went, yeah, we're, we're just, no, we'll go back to Turak and Brighton. We don't want to live here. And why would you? You're the only rich person in the building and then you've got all these idiots living underneath you. There's no community. There's no feeling. There's nothing. It's a soulless, empty tower, you know? I mean, Docklands is just terrible. I went to Docklands just recently with my wife and um, the first time I went to Docklands Harbour Town, as it's called now, they keep changing the name, we went to Harbour Town when we first had our little baby girl, Tiliana, and she's nine now. And I remember she was about one. We, we had the pram. We parked there. We paid $40 for car park. We went to Harbour Town. And within 10 minutes, we realised the same shops that we have in Doncaster Shopping Centre. And my wife says, why the hell did we come here again? I said, I don't know, but let's never come back here again. And we agreed. And then when Tilly was about four, we went back to Harbour Town again. And this time she was walking and... Um, and we thought, you know what, it's a nice day out in Melbourne, let's go to Harbour Town, let's, uh, let's check out what's happening there. So we went there, we parked, we paid $40 for, for parking, we walked around, half the shops were empty, and then we realised it was the same shops that we have in Doncaster Shopping Centre, which is my shopping centre, and then after about two hours, my wife says, why the hell did we come here again? 
And I said, I have no idea, but let's never come back here again. Now, in earlier this year, in January, we had our 20-year wedding anniversary, my wife and I, and our daughter's nine now, and because we originally had a holiday plan to go to Sydney and spend a week there, we had to cancel our holiday because, like everyone else, we've been trapped in Melbourne um, and we couldn't travel. So we um, booked a penthouse in the city and we stayed in the city and did the Melbourne touristy city thing. So we went to South Bank, you know, did Chinatown, went to the museum, went to... Uh, Crown Casino, so, you know, had breakfast, lunch and dinner out every day virtually. It was really cool, by the way, because I, I haven't been in the city as a tourist for a long time. Went to Aquarium for a day, which was awesome. We ended up going to Harbour Town. And we did go on the Ferris wheel, which was great. Harbour Town now, I think 60% of the shops are all empty. They're, they're all vacated. And once again, we went, why the hell did we come here again? There's nothing here. And, <laughs> and my wife says, I don't know, but let's not come back here ever again. There is nothing in Harbour Town. And the problem is this. When the original plan was, was conceived and, we, and the government, the Victorian government, had the option of building and redeveloping that part of the world, which is Docklands, the original plan of subdivision was intended to build a rich upmarket, three, four level Houses like Mervag did in, 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 in um, South Melbourne for four, five, six to ten million dollars. So the original concept was to build a village like, Turek village like community of very wealthy people and high end shops, right? So you had rows of, you, had, you would have had Rolex there, you would have had Cartier, you would have had Louis Vuitton, Gucci. Phenomenal. It would have been an amazing experience, you know? So we would go there. Rather than having the same crappy shops that we have in shopping centres, we could go down to Harbour Town and see all the luxury shops, have a coffee, you know, walk around, look how the rich people live with their boats. But the left-wing socialist, neo-socialist Marx people in Victoria, uh, but we don't want to have rich people living there. What about affordable housing? What about police officers and teachers that can't get into the market? We need to have, we need to have solutions for them. So the government buckled and allowed those idiots to take control and build high-density redevelopments like this shit. And now, no one wants to live there. First of all, they couldn't even get the sales off the ground because no one would buy these apartments in Melbourne, so they had to go overseas and flog them overseas to Singapore, Malaysia, and other countries where people live in apartments, right? Because in Hong Kong, in Malaysia, just so you know, not so much Malaysia, but Singapore, everyone lives in apartments. So they think Australians live in apartments, but we don't live in apartments. We want to live in houses in, in, in Australia predominantly. So they couldn't get the sales here locally because it's a shit product. So they had to go overseas and flog, flog it over there and convince them this thing would work. And now they've got all these towers there. It's a dead, soulless, empty place, right? No one wants to go there. And they're building more of them and, and it doesn't work in the first place. Melbourne should be ashamed of itself and this is a massive, massive opportunity that we missed out because of the Labor government stuffing up and building affordable housing in an area that should have been built up as upmarket, exclusive residential properties for high net worth individuals. We could have really redeveloped the part of the world so well, it could have put Melbourne on the map, it would have been an amazing experience to go there on the weekends and now no one wants to go to the weekends. Why the hell would you go to Harbour Town? You get the same shops in Chatsden Shopping Centre, Southland Shopping Centre, every shopping centre, Knox, and you don't pay for parking. It doesn't make sense. The whole thing is just broken and it's not going to recover. You know? And this is the problem. We've got to stop listening to these lefties um, that we have in, in, in the Labour um, government and the Greenies about you know, sustainable housing. It's not sustainable. It never will be. Okay? You just get used to it. But that's the biggest, biggest missed opportunities that Melbourne had. And now it's too late. You can't rip these things down. You can't do anything. They're, you're going to be stuck with these um, empty towers for a long, long time. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to go to Singapore and buy back all the apartments? They're all strata titled. What are you going to do? Nothing. Like, these things will be empty for a long time. And no one in Melbourne wants to go there. <laughs> it's just it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Anyway, these are the top most oversupplied apartment suburbs in Australia. So you can see the Melbourne postcode 3000. Next 24 months, they're building 4,744 apartments. Um, 
which is 13.6% um, of new units um, as a percentage of build. Then you have Victoria Docklands, right, 1,307. Mascot, you know, this is Sydney, obviously, New South Wales. You've got all the New South Wales suburbs. NT, Queensland, and, and in Adelaide, 1,266. And there is no demand for these properties. There is no demand from the local um, you know, investors, no demand from local owner-occupiers. Um, eventually, they'll be taken up. Yes, eventually, in the 10 years, 20 years' time, when Melbourne population swells, then eventually they'll be taken up. In the short term, it's going to be ghost town. And these are the number of units forecasting settlements. This is the biggest built-up areas of how many units are being built over the next um, two years. So we're talking about thousands of units being built in the marketplace and people prefer townhouses and detached houses over apartments. And this is one of the problems. So, you know, there's a massive oversupply of apartments in Melbourne. These are the towers that represent future builds in Melbourne. Have a look at them. There's 13,000 more apartments in construction or waiting approval in central Melbourne. Now, I think, like, once again, I said it's a good thing for the city to have these built. I like the aesthetics of them. Don't get me wrong. From an investment perspective, it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen because there's no capital growth there. You know, and Docklands is, by the way, different than the Melbourne city. I think in the Melbourne city, you should have towers, but Docklands, it should be all low-density townhouses, like the ones that Murbeck has built around South Melbourne. They're selling for about 4 to $8 million. They're fantastic, you know? So these are all the towers that are being built. Guys, even in the city itself, like some of these towers, you know, you've got 468 apartments in Lonsdale Street, 560, uh, 536 officers in William Street. Um, in Lonsdale Street, 613 to 649 is 2,500 apartments. It's great for the city to keep building them. <coughs> no, don't invest your money in them, guys. They're building 63,000 apartments in Melbourne. Some have been now obviously put on hold because of COVID-19. Some are in the process of getting approved. Some are being built as we speak. So once again, I want to clarify. I like the aesthetics of them. I think they're cool. I would never put my money in there. Okay? It's a disaster. It's completely oversupplied and it misses the local demand for the average person. The average person in Australia doesn't want to live on the 87th floor of this apartment, okay? It doesn't work for them. They want to be in suburbs like Elwood, St Kilda, where they can have a little property, school, community, coffee, gym, everything's there, okay? So it's not going to change for a long time. As a result of this, the lenders, and this is the biggest challenge, is the lending institutions have come out and said, you know what, we don't like apartments. We're going to blacklist them completely which means we're going to restrict lending, forget about 80%, 70% and 60% for some of these suburbs. So GNQB, which is the two major lenders insurance uh, underwriters in Australia, which do lenders mortgage insurance, won't even touch them. Not only that, the biggest blacklisted areas, if you look at Victoria, is Melbourne 3000 postcode, Melbourne 3004, World Trade Centre 3005, South Bank, South Yarra, Docklands, South Melbourne and South Melbourne DC. You know, so... You have the same similar situation in Sydney and similar situation in Queensland. So these are the areas you don't want to invest in because if you do buy an apartment for seven hundred thousand dollars, let's say two better, you can you can only borrow sixty percent, seventy percent LVR, maybe eighty if you're lucky, but most of the time it's seventy, and then you'll never be able to get the additional thirty percent equity out of the property. See, with apartments, you have a lending restriction imposed on the type of dwelling that it represents. Where if you buy a townhouse in South Melbourne, you can buy up to 90% against the property. So you get equity out and go again. So the, the opportunity cost of parking your money and your, your limited serviceability in an apartment is that you're always going to have equity locked up in an apartment that you will never be able to get. And that's two or three more deposits over 10 years for another two or three properties. So the opportunity cost isn't just buying an asset that doesn't even appreciate in value. And by the way, other clients that, that listen to this, in 2010, bought a two-bedroom apartment in the Docklands for 650, and they had it valued last week for 570. Forget about no growth, negative growth over 10 years, and they're paying three and a half thousand dollars per year on body corporate fees. It, it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. 
Now, if you want to live there, that's different. If you're living there and you're enjoying the facilities and you've got the city, that's cool. That's cool. That's a living. But investing, i.e. making money, guys, it's negative. You might as well just go to the Crown and, 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 and spend your money at the Crown. You know, because then you have a small odd of winning. There, you, you can't win, no matter what you do. So, don't, don't do it. <laughs> um, so, these are the blacklisted postcodes. So, even the lenders, the most profitable institutions in Australia, are telling you, stay away from apartments, especially in these postcodes. Especially. Now, I'll show you which areas you can invest in in a second, okay? It's not, don't get suicidal. It's not all doom and gloom. Okay, so Melbourne Apartments. Um, the Melbourne suburbs with the largest price gap between houses and units. So what you want to do is there's a magic formula, which is called a three to one ratio, which exists between in suburbs between detached houses and apartments. So you only want to buy apartments if you need to buy them. And if you want to buy them, I'll be targeting established Art Deco apartments with ground floor courtyards in low density 10, 15, 20 max. Okay, never go to 50 because then it's classified high density. And then I would be buying them in South Yarra, Armadale, Ormond, those areas, Turek, um, you know, uh, Richmond definitely, and those surrounding areas. So all the 1930s, 1920s apartments that can be subdivided later on or sold to developers for high density rezoning. My office in St Kilda, for example, is here in, in Alma Road. Just next to my, my office is a, a, a 1970s cream brick veneer apartment complex with about 30 apartments. Now, that apartment development got sold recently to one developer who's putting a tower there, and all the people came together with these older apartments. They got together, and they basically got a development approval for high-density, and they got the site rezoned high-density, and they got an approval for a high-density tower. So you can do that with all the 70s and 80s apartments, but you just got to be careful and do your research. That's a good strategy, yeah, because then you have an exit point and you actually make money. And they've actually got offered more than twice the value of each apartment. So they made a killing. The same situation exists on St Kilda Boulevard, uh, Brighton Road. You know, So there are examples in St Kilda, St Kilda East, of all the apartments that are low density that were rezoned into higher density and flipped to a developer. That's a good strategy, because then that's not buy and hold, that's buy add value to the asset, and then change the nature of the asset and flick it to a developer. That, that is good. So if I was buying things like that, that's a good strategy to have, and then you can obviously benefit. It is a gamble, because you might not get rezoned, and number two, you might not be able to sell it. But if there's like 10 or 15 owners in there, and they're not overseas owners, they're Australian owners, a lot of them will have the apartments paid off, you can then get them together and say, look, let's get together, let's pull all our resources together and get this thing rezoned, and then flick it to a developer and make a killing. So these are the areas we have a three-to-one ratio between the detached house and an apartment, and this is in December quarter 2020. So Turak, the average median price of a house is $4.18 million, and the average two-bedroom apartment is nine fifty. So the gap is $3.2 million. So if you, can't, if you want to live in Turak, it's either a two-bedroom or nothing. Because most people will be completely priced out of detached houses in Turek. So there, you can buy a department, and it is the best suburb to buy apartments, long-term growth. Once again, all the apartments, low density, and I will do a renovation. New kitchen, new bathroom, and do a reno to the property. Then it's worth it, and especially target Art Deco apartments with high 2.8 to 3 metre ceilings. Because no one's going to do 3 metre ceilings in apartments anymore. So, so what you want is height, and then you can just refurbish them and, um, and focus on those areas. Brighton's another good suburb. Detached houses are 2.8 million. A two-bedroom is 970. The difference between that is 1.9 million. So you can see the three-to-one ratio there, right? Three-to-one ratio. Well, this is four-to-one ratio. Four apartments make up one house. Malvern's another good area. Two beds are 660. Detached houses are 2.3 million. Great opportunity. Baldwin, great suburb. Once again, don't buy new, buy old. 630, 2.1 million. Hawthorne, really good suburb. One of the best suburbs in Melbourne, Hawthorne. Okay? Hawthorne in Shakespeare Road, there's been sales there for $35 million. But you can get a two better in Hawthorne for 603,500. Detached houses are 2.1 million. So once again, you've got that three to one ratio. Three times 600,000 is 1.8 million. Q, another phenomenal suburb. 
Once again, two betters worked well. Hawthorne East, 1.9 million versus 630,000. Glen Iris. So I did a last apartment development that I sourced was in Glen Iris, corner of Burke Road and Malvern Road, called Vivid. And that went really well. Um, they were selling for 7,000 a square metre, and now they're selling for 10,000 a square metre. So, you know, at 687,250 for two betters, and then detached houses at 2 million and 50. Elston Week, another top suburb, 661,000. Did a lot of apartments in Elston Week about seven years ago when they were cheap. $2 million for a house in Armadale. So, th- so if you want to buy an apartment, if you, if you have to buy one, which I still don't want you to get it, okay? <laughs> By the way, I've got these available for sale, and I'm a real estate agent. I can source these. So if you want to buy in Elston or Glen Iris, I've got the stock, so I can make a commission out of it. So you, just remember this. I'm trying to convince you not to do something that I can sell you and make money out of, okay? And the reason I can do that is because I don't want to be, unbi- I want to be completely unbiased here. Because if I didn't have them available, then I could say, oh, don't buy there because I haven't got them. No, I've got them. Okay? But I'm just telling you, there's going to be very little growth there. Now, what growth can you expect in these suburbs? Five, six percent maximum over 10 years. You'll never get 10% on apartments. Forget it. The houses would do 10%, but not apartments. Townhouses would do 10%, but never apartments. So, even, so you're either going to get zero or negative in Docklands and South Bank. South Melbourne, South Yarra, 2-3%, just keeping up with inflation. And the best suburbs in Melbourne, which are these, you're going to get 5 or 6%, which means you'll double every 15 years. You know? um, that's okay to consider. That's, that's not a problem. That's macro level, so big picture stuff. Let's go micro level. So what you want to do is when you're targeting apartments... Number one is you've got to look at the income demographics of the suburb. You want to be buying apartments where there's the highest income per capita. So where they don't work is, for example, Mitcham. Mitcham is a great suburb for houses and townhouses, but Mitcham's median price is 900000 and the two-bed is six fifty. So how, if you get a house for nine hundred and a two-bedroom apartment for six fifty, how does that work? There's no three-to-one ratio. Therefore, apartments in Mitcham won't do anything. They'll grow at inflation, 2.5%, 3% per annum. So remember that magic three to one ratio. You've got to look at the lending restrictions on apartments. If there's a lending restrictions imposed on the apartment, don't buy them. Whatever reason, don't buy them. Um, so um, historical capital growth and future potential capital growth is what you've got to look at. RP data reports on apartments in South Yarra versus Glen Iris, for example. The proximity of the project to the city and central lifestyle amenities. It's all about surrounding lifestyle amenities. The reason that people live in Hawthorne, in Kew, in Baldwin, in Brighton, in Turak is because the cafes, the transport, the schools, the prestige, the safety of the area, plus proximity to the city. Um, also, availability of transport and freeway infrastructure to the area. I mean, these are all very centrally located properties in the eastern suburbs. Very close, except for Bayside, obviously, um, Brighton. But very close access, to, very quick access to the city. Best schools in Melbourne, rich areas, safety. Vacancy rates are very low. The volume of stock being offered in the area by other developers, that's very important because you might go to Hawthorne, but Hawthorne at the moment is oversaturated with apartments. So I, would, I wouldn't even buy there at the moment if I had to. The volume of stock coming onto the market in the area, so you might want to check out with the local council how many apartments have been approved in the next two or three years. So you can go to a senior town planner in every council and ask them this question. I'm thinking of buying an apartment in Elwood. How many apartments are in the pipeline? And if you want to, there's actually a company called Cadell. Cadell actually has reports on volume of, of apartments and houses and townhouses coming up uh, in the future. So you can buy reports from them and they will tell you the volume of stock coming on the market. And the strategy of the council for the area. See, some councils are very hostile towards apartments. Like in Brighton, it's very difficult to build apartments. In fact, some suburban parts of Brighton, you can't build any apartments ever. Uh, and if you look at Sandringham, they've actually, and Bentley, they've rezoned certain streets to have apartments. And the local community has been very pissed off with the council. And in fact, they've blocked some of these monstrosities to be built. And I personally, where I live, I don't want any apartments being built in my suburb because my, my theory is if you can't afford to live there in a house, shouldn't live there. That's the reality because it would devalue my house. So and I've worked hard for my house. I don't want apartments built next door with 30, 40 people. You know, I, I don't even like my neighbour. There's one of them. <laughs> I I've never met my neighbour, by the way. So, <laughs> so I, I live in the eastern suburbs on a massive block. I don't know anyone. I just, the gates open up, I drive in, they close behind me. No one knows who I am. And I've got tinted windows on my cars. 
I'm very antisocial in real life, by the way. I don't, I'm a single child from a broken marriage. Do you know what I mean? I don't play well with others. That's why all the sports I've ever done, which was swimming, powerlifting, kickboxing, it's always me against me. You know, I don't like teams. Then you've got to look at the cost per square meter compared to other selling stock in the area. So, for example, apartments right now in St Kilda are selling for 9500 per square meter. Well, let's call it 10000 a square meter. So, 55 square meters, 550000 65 square meters, 650. You know, so, so if you know the cost per square meter, you won't get ripped off. You know, and, and this is why people say, oh, I don't like buying brand new because I overpay. No, you overpay when you overpay. You overpay because you don't know the price of things. It doesn't matter if it's brand new or old. If the price is 10,000 a square meter, you're paying 8,000 a square meter, you're getting a bargain. You're getting 20% below market. So people overpay when they overpay. It doesn't matter if it's brand new, old. It's just stupid. There's a lot of stupid things in there. Like, you always make money on the way in. Well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So, so apartments that were 100,000 20 years ago, and now that we're 700, what discount could I get for those apartments to make me 600,000. Doesn't that mean the vendor will pay me 600,000? So how can I possibly make money on the way in? It's, it's, it's the dumbest thing. You know, you always make money on the way in. No, you don't. You make money when you make money. It doesn't matter if it's all the way in, out, sideways. It's, it's, it's how much you invest, how much you get returns on. It just People say this stuff, I don't even know where it comes from, but some of the dumbest things I've ever heard, you know? Oh, you overpay on new things. No, you overpay when you overpay. <laughs> the size of the property, the number of bedrooms, and demand for that type of property in the area. Very important, guys. In St Kilda and Elwood, you have 60% single people living here and under 25. You can get away with shoeboxes, small property, small bedrooms, three metres by 3.2, you know, tiny living areas. But once you go to, for example, Burwood, or let's go further out, let's go to Doncaster, you need large three-bedroom town uh, apartments. Master bedroom has to be four meters by, by 4.5, you know, even five, because you're dealing with families. There's big houses there. Land is, is relatively cheap. So you need to have apartments that are massive with large balconies. The further you go out from the city, the larger the living area should be. And you should have a separate living and dining area, plus the kitchen with island bench tops, plus multiple balconies. Um, so you've got to have, you've got to work out whether the layout is suitable for the demographics of the area and match the property. So the layout and configuration of the property, the floor plan is super important. In fact, I'll show you in a second some of the floor plans and what's wrong with some of the designs. The level and quality of fixtures and fittings throughout the property. So you want to go, you don't want to overcapitalize either, but you want to go building's range is fine. Unless you're building Turek and Brighton, you've got to go above builder's range. You've got to go for a little bit higher fixtures and fittings. You know, German or Italian stainless steel appliances, uh, parquetry floors, higher ceilings, you know, smart technology. Uh, you can do, um, you know, built-in air conditioning, all that kind of stuff. The builders and developers' experience and track record. This is the key behind everything, guys. Builders and developers' experience and track record. Multiple award-winning developers and builders. You know, you don't want to deal with people that are mums and dads developers working from home. It's always a disaster. It's a complete disaster. So you want to have a company that's been in the industry for 20 years, has won awards, so you can physically go and inspect the last 10 projects. And you can see that what they look like 10 years later. You know, If every property that I source for my clients, we physically inspect the last five to 10 projects. If we can't get access to them, we don't source properties. Because I know that with people that are award-winning architects, um, like Branson Group, they, they brag about their properties because they've won awards. Yeah, go and see them. I'll give you, we've got them on their website. We've got a whole portfolio on our website. You can see all the photos, you know, video fly-throughs. Whenever the person is dodgy, they go, why do you want to see them for? Don't you trust me? I said, why should I trust you? I just met you. Trust is built up over time. No, I don't trust you at all. Show me your past projects. And if they get kind of, oh, yeah, well, you can t it's hard. We haven't got the materials. It's a disaster. So you're telling me your, your past projects are rubbish and you're too scared to show me. So whenever you're buying a property, insist to see the previous work of that person. Doesn't it, it makes logical sense, right? I would never buy something from a company that's unknown who refuses to show me any past projects. 
Because remember, these guys, if they win awards, they, they want to brag about it, like a mortgage broker. Whenever you see a mortgage broker or a real estate agent with awards, they put it in their signature so everyone knows, hey, I want all these stickers and I'm the top MPA broker. Hey, look at me, <laughs> you know? They don't hide it. People that hide it haven't got any results. <laughs> it's the same with sports. You want to have a coach that won gold medal or someone that never even competed. I mean, it's logical, right? It's the same with property. So, so it's the same thing. Plans and configuration. So one bedroom apartment should be minimum 50 square meters internal plus balcony. Never buy one bedroom apartment that are less than 50 square meters internal. Never buy them. They don't resell well. They're classified as studio apartments. Automatic lending restriction of 80%. Yes, there are lenders that will throw in the balcony, like AZ will include the balcony in the size, but just don't buy them. One bedroom should be 55 to 65 square meters, okay? Must have a car park, never buy an apartment without a car park, and the storage cage. No more than 50 in the project, should be less than 50, 20, 30 maximum, even 10, 15 is good. I mean, I did a small one in Brighton, it's on my website, eight apartments, you know, in Asling Street. Um, you want to do boutique minimum so you have the largest land component. Master bedroom must have minimum 3.5 metres by 3 with windows and natural light, and that's tiny. You want to have 4.5 by 4 as, a, as an optional amount, but it depends on where you are. Separate kitchen and dining area. Um, 60 square metres to 70 square metres is optimal with built-in walk-through robes and en-suites. Study nook is a huge advantage. Main bedroom must be, have windows, lots of natural light, and 10 square metre balcony or terrace area. So let me just show you an example. This is a one-bedroom apartment. Internal is 44 square metres, external 11.4, so 55.8. Um, square meters, one car park storage. So good, it's got a car park, got storage. Bad design, you've got dead space, and this bedroom has no natural light. Never buy a property like this. It's a really bad design. Even though you have natural light technically by opening up the wall, this is not a good design. See, this is a good design, and this property is smaller. It's actually 43 square meters, but have a look at this. You enter, and there's no dead space. So here, you've already, you've lost this, this space here. You can't use this corridor. It's dead space, right? Where here, you enter, there's no dead space, number one. Number two, the bedroom here has natural light from the balcony. So you've got this massive balcony. So you've got this light coming in for the whole property. That's a good design. So once again, bad design because the bedroom is inside the, the property. Um, and this is a good design. Now, this is a great design. This is one of the best one bedrooms. So total area 71 square meters, internal 50 square meters, and 21 square meter balcony and courtyard. So you have, so you walk in straight into the living area, no dead space, okay? You've got a laundry, and then you've got a toilet for the guests, so they don't need to come into your ensuite. And then you've got your bedroom, okay, with an ensuite, so your private bathroom. Because remember, the ba your bathroom is always gonna be a mess, right? My bathroom, <laughs> in my ensuite, <laughs> looks like someone just broke into our house and went through all our stuff. Because I've got a separate ensuite to my wife's ensuite. Um, it looks like you know, there was an earthquake. Um, so when you have guests coming over, you want to have this clean toilet they can go and use, not your private toilet in your bedroom. Then your bedroom, well, look at this. Open up these whole walls, you've got this massive natural light coming in. That is one of the best layouts for a one bedroom that I've seen. And it's only 50 square meters internal, plus the, the balcony. It doesn't have to be big guys, it's just about quality and thought process. Um, this is the best, probably, one bedroom that I sourced. And this is in Glenaris in a development called Vivid. And it was 61 square meters internal. Balcony was seven square meters. Car space storage, it had a study. So you come in, no dead space. Kitchen island bench top, study nook with built in cabinetry. So you've got a desk there. So people from working from home, they've got a study. Okay, you're not, not, not another bedroom that you're paying for, it's a study. Then you have the bathroom. The only negative is you have only one bathroom and toilet. So once again, if you're messy, that's the only negative one of these uh, about this property. Then you've got your bedroom there, plenty of natural light. Doors open up and you've got a balcony, so plenty of natural light. Really good configuration for a one bedroom apartment. Two bedroom apartments should be a minimum of 65 square meters internal size plus balcony, two bedrooms, two bathrooms, or never buy two bedroom apartments with one bathroom and one toilet. It has there's two bathrooms and then a toilet on top of it. 
must have a car park. And ideally, you want to get two if you can. If you can buy an additional car park, buy it, you'll rent before all the others. And car parks will cost you $35,000 to $50,000. Storage cage is a must. Has to have storage cage. You can buy them sometimes separately on the separate title, which is cool. Located in a project, no more than 50 apartments. Once again, the smaller the better. Never go over 50. Master bedroom must be 3.5 by 4 metres with windows. Separate kitchen dining area, 70 to, 6 to 95 square metres is optimum. Built walk-in through robes. En suite, study look is a huge advantage. Main bedroom must have windows and lots of natural light. And a 50 square metre balcony. So, for example, this is an okay, not a good plan, 57 square metres and external 30 square metres. It's a great courtyard, but the problem is this. Dead space, dead space, no light, one little window. All this dead space you're paying for. And the bedrooms are next to each other, and essentially you have one bathroom, one ensuite for everyone. So two bedrooms and the, and the guests sharing one ensuite. Bad layout, don't buy it, they don't do well. This is excellent, okay? You have internal... 80 square metres, external 54 square metres, even too large, I would say. You don't need 54. So 135 square metres. But look at this. You come in, no dead space. You've got a study nook, ensuite, bedroom, plenty of natural light, living area, another ensuite, another bedroom, another balcony, and a courtyard. So separate bedrooms away from each other, no dead space, um, maximising every square inch of that space, plenty of natural light, and you can open up these, these are um, bifold doors or sliding doors, they slide into each other. So you can open up and bring the outside in. Very good design. So this one, bad design, once again, dead space, only one bathroom to share between two bedrooms and guests. Not a good design. This is the best uh, two bedrooms that, I, that I've seen for a long time. I sourced this property in Glen Iris for a client of mine. And this property was, internal area was <clears throat> um, 93 square metres, external was 87 square metres. Look at the size of the terrace. It was huge. So you come into the property, you have a bathroom, which is cool, and a toilet. Then you've got the master bedroom with built-in robes and ensuite. So you've got this little separate master bedroom. This is a separate bedroom as well. That's the bathroom for that bedroom. Yes, ideally we have another bathroom, but it doesn't. But it doesn't matter, it could be a study. Then open plan living, kitchen area, and then you have a terrace all the way wrapping around there with views overlooking the eastern suburbs. So that was sourced around seven years ago now uh, in Glen Iris, and uh, it did really well. We were selling them for about 7,000 square metre. I mean, it was just phenomenal. Anyway, that's it pretty much for apartments. I hope you enjoyed this, this part of my education um, about what to look for, what to avoid. So once again, just to summarise, what you want is plenty of natural light. You want rooms with sliding doors. You want to have natural light independently going to your bedrooms. Bedrooms need to have the right own suites. And what you want to be really careful with is dead space. So just because the property has good square meterage doesn't mean that all of it is usable. Corridors have no usage. You're paying for something that you're not using why you have it in the first place. With apartments, you just want to walk straight to the living area, okay? There is no advantage of having dead space corridors um, built in. So that's it pretty much. By the way, if you want to learn more, you can scroll down just below this video um, in the description. There's a link to a free home study that you can access with $497. You can watch that, and that's uh, over 10 hours of recording that was done in um, about five years ago. It's still very current. There's a lot of stuff that I cover there. So enjoy that. That's absolutely free for you. And also, if you're interested in learning more, because I'm not doing any live events, I want to offer you guys a 60-minute free strategy session with myself. So if you want to sit down with someone and work out a plan of attack, um, I can help you with that. And I'm doing a limited amount of these sessions this year. When I, when I start doing my live events again, I'm going to stop doing these um, sessions. Now, remember, in life, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. The most important thing about investing is to have a clear strategy in mind and then have the psychology to understand why it works and then have the team that can implement it for you. So there's four things you need to become successful in property investing. Number one is mindset psychology. What does that mean? It means you, you have to understand you've got to leverage yourself to wealth, not save yourself to wealth. And the whole game is about using other people's money, leveraging, borrowing money to invest in capital appreciating assets. Okay. 
Then you've got to have the right team behind you, the right accountant, the right you know, mortgage broker or mortgage strategist, solicitor, et cetera, et cetera, to implement it for you. Then you've got to have a plan, and then you've got to have the right property selection methodology. When you have those things synchronized, you'll succeed. What I do in the strategy is I work out where you are currently, which is point A, your current financial situation, where you want to be in the future, point B. And that could be income replacement, it could be capital growth. And then I'll show you the fastest way to get from A to B in a straight line. Otherwise, what happens in people's lives is they get busy and they do this. And then 10 years later, they're no closer to getting their, reaching their objectives than they were 10 years ago. So in one hour session, I'll sit down with you or I'll go through a session over Zoom, um, work out where you are, where you want to be, give you a rough pre-approval. I'll tell you your serviceability if it's a simple situation. If it's complex, or if you've got multiple properties in trust, I'll refer you to a good mortgage broker. They'll give you a funding proposal. And then I'll, I'll do a personal introduction to my whole team, my mortgage broker, my accountant, my lawyer, everyone you need to work out how much you can borrow and how to invest. And then I can even source properties for you. So all I do all day, guys, by the way, is work with investors like yourself when they get into the property market and I source properties directly from builders and developers, the best award-winning builders and developers in Melbourne. So if you want my assistance in helping you build your wealth, by all means, get in contact with me um, just through my email and we can set up a Zoom meeting. The whole advantage of this, of this meeting is just to get my whole team. I mean, it took me a decade to find these people. They are the best in the industry. Many of them have been featured on my YouTube channel and my book. Some have contributed chapters to my book. Some have done interviews and, and done sessions on my YouTube channel, like James Black from Brand Inco and Stephen McClatchy from Mines Australia. The whole purpose of the strategy session is to work out how to get from A to B in the fastest possible way with the path of least resistance. So it's a step-by-step -step system, and I'll give you an email summary at the end saying, this is what you need to do first. Contact this person, get a pre-approval, go to the accountant, do this, come to me, I'll source the properties for you, go to the lawyer, get the contract of sale checked, etc., etc., etc. So it's literally step-by-step, -step, paid by numbers. It is super, super clear, like with your plan. And you know, people just spend their whole life without ever, ever developing a plan of how to invest in their money. So you've got to qualify for these sessions. There's no fee, there's no obligation. You just have to have a minimum ability to buy a $700,000 property because honestly, I don't have any properties under $700,000. Um, they don't exist in the suburbs that I source. So for a single person, you've got to have at least an income of $95,000 per year and equity or savings of $112,000. We can get you into the first townhouse um, or detached house. And then for a couple, you need to be on about one forty combined with $112,000 accessible equity. If you have those, then we can definitely sit down, do a Zoom session. I can give you some feedback and give you some guidance on how to get from A to B. Um, and that's about it. So all you've got to do if you're interested in getting a strategy session with me or just getting in contact with me to source some properties for you is contact me at conrad at investorsprime.com.au. And that's my personal email um, here in St Kilda in my office. And I'll be in contact with you and I can definitely assist you either finding great properties or doing a strategy session with you as well. And once again, there's no cost, no obligation with that as well. So it's a great, and I love doing these. I do a couple every day. It's a great way to meet my, my clients. I have a lot of people that have read my books, been to my live events and see my home study online. And uh, it's a great, great way I can reconnect with people. And look, I've saved people from making a lot of mistakes, you know, um, don't make mistakes, guys. It's very expensive to buy the wrong property in the wrong area. Not only because you're going to lose money, it's the opportunity cost, guys. You can't waste 10 years sitting on a bad property in Dockland somewhere or Point Cook or Pakenham and going, shit, I should have bought somewhere else. Um, I've made 50 grand or something, 100 grand in 10 years. I could have made half a million to a million, you know. That opportunity cost will set you back decades. So property investing is all about long-term gain but it's about working smart as well as working hard. That's it for me, guys. Thank you very much for watching this YouTube video. Subscribe to my channel. This is Conrad Bobby Lack. I'll see you on the inside.